call this workshop to order, please? San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, Samir, Deputy APCO. Are you here? Okay, you're up. Good evening. Hello. Uh, my name is Samir Sheikh, and I am a Deputy Air Pollution Control Officer. I'm also, uh, you know, I, I want, yes, it's on. You guys can hear me okay? All right. I'm also um, actually the incoming uh, air pollution control officer. Um, our governing board appointed me to replace um, Sayed Saturdin, who I'm sure most of you um, know um, as uh, he's our current air pollution control officer. He's retiring. He's leaving in July. And at that point, I'll be officially in my, in my new capacity. So I wanted to come in and first just uh, introduce myself in, in that role. I've been here um, a couple of times for these presentations in the past. I've come with Sayed in the past. And it's always been a very, you know, good conversation with you. It's always been good to catch up on some of the key issues and really take your input as we move forward with, with our jobs. So I look forward to that again tonight. Um, I really wanted to, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I did want to focus in on a, on a couple of key updates and some, I think, time sort of sensitive information and relevant information and hopefully have a couple of minutes at least at the end to, you know, to take any questions and have that dialogue with you as well. Um, the first thing that um, I want to really start with, and something that I, 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 I kind of keep having to, to update and make sure I include in every conversation that we have, you know, particularly with elected officials, but really in any, any forum, is really this progress that we've seen these last several years with respect to air quality. And it's something that you don't often hear out there because of some of the issues that you sometimes see in the wintertime, some of the ongoing challenges that clearly we have to deal with in the valley. But one of the big things that we've also seen is that over the years, if you really look at all the investments that we've all made through your help, working with businesses as well, in clean air technologies, we are seeing the, the benefits um, from, from those investments with respect to air quality. So over, you know, over the last you know, decade or so, we've seen a very, very steady drop in both ozone and particulate levels. And it's something that you know, when, when you talk about some of the new tough things that we have to do, and I'll get, I'll get to those issues here in a little bit, with respect to our new attainment plans that we have to write, you know, some of the things that you all have to deal with when it, you know, when it comes to um, having to deal with those attainment plans and national standards. Um, it's really important to kind of start from that, from that place, that foundation of, well, you know, we've asked people to invest billions of dollars over the years. It's, it's work that's really helped, and that's the foundation that we now use to talk about, well, what, where do we go from here to really continue that progress and deal with some of the new standards that we have. So we've left no stone unturned in looking for opportunities, whether it's mobile sources and you know and you've seen all the the new standards that have come out there whether it's stationary sources a lot of regulations that we put into place over the years you know everything from residential wood burning you know all the way to the lar largest industries there's been a lot of activity going on there over these these last couple of decades and we've achieved a lot of a lot of resulting air quality benefits um, in the process of doing so you know one of the the, the big um, milestones that we talk about is on, on cancer risk related to air quality. We've seen a 95% reduction in cancer risk um, with, as a result of these measures. Now, there's still a long ways to go, and I'll get to that in a minute in terms of where we're going from here. But it's really important, again, to mention some of these, some of these benefits. Population exposure to high ozone days, we've seen a 90% reduction there. And um, unfortunately, in, in Kern County, you know, it's one of the areas that are still kind of a hot spot for us when it comes to ozone. Um, so we're continuing to look for ways to, to partner and continue getting some emission reductions down here, particularly. Um, but we have seen a huge benefit. That includes spent benefits here in Kern County as well. With PM 2.5, as far as population exposure to the high, highest levels of PM 2.5, about an 85% reduction from, from our base levels over the years as well. You know, one of the, one of the big initiatives that we're... Um, launching right now and it's something that I really wanted to fill you in on it, it's something that you're going to start seeing a lot of media um, uh, campaigns and, and a lot of conversation going on in the public realm is with, with respect to how we provide our air quality information to the public you know this is something that comes up very often you know the re valley residents want tools that let them know what the air quality levels are and you know what they might be able to do to take care of themselves whenever you see air quality reaching certain levels, how to easily access our check before you burn, residential wood burning information, how to file complaints in, you know, in, a, in a very easy fashion um, through an app, for example. These are things that we've been working on and have recently launched, actually, as of this week, 
uh, new apps for both iPhone and Android. They're available right now, both on the App Store and the Google Play Store. That really provide um, some really um, uh, new and interesting um, ways of, of looking at air quality. So for for the RAN program, the Real Time um, Air Quality Advisory Network, it's something that we've had in place for a number of years. We've made that now neighborhood level RAN through this app. So using this app, you can now just you know put in current location. It'll actually tell you using a combination of our air quality monitors and the modeling that we've done what the air quality is at that particular location. You can save multiple locations, you can set alerts, you can check before you burn status during the winter time. There's a lot of really cool features that are available in these apps now, so we're doing some really um, heavy marketing right now to get the word out about, about those apps. Um, we're also working on um, the website component of that as well. There, there's a lot of new features, um, you know, including more Spanish resources, some, some things that we've heard about how we can enhance how we communicate that information to the public. So there's a lot of really cool things that are going on in that realm that I think, you know, as you kind of talk to your constituents about these issues and hear concerns that, and hopefully they're going to they're gonna see some, some benefit and value as we move forward with these things. Kind of along those lines, I wanted to, to let you know as well that we've been having some conversations with um, uh, locally here about using um, other mechanisms for advertising and getting the, the word out about these programs. One of those mechanisms that we're looking at right now, and I wanted to just make this uh, positive announcement tonight, is is using the, the bus transit system down here to as a means of, of actually advertising um, the Healthier Living program, the tools that we have available. It's something that we're actually actively um, working to put into place right now. So. Really appreciate the suggestion that <laughs> came in to, to, to utilize that as, as a potential and effective mechanism to get the word out. And I think there's going to be a positive partnership there to continue to expand the way that we uh, communicate with folks down here and, uh, and get the word out about some of the efforts that are going on there. So I encourage you to download that app if, uh, and let us know how, you know how it's working for you. Give us feedback. Um, we're hearing really positive response so far with it out there. And we think it's going to be a, a cool tool for the, for the public to, to use. One of the other really big um, and timely initiatives that I, I wanted to bring up, and, and if you have any ideas or, or, or suggestions for where we could continue to focus our efforts in this area, is the Healthier Living Schools program. Um, there, we, um, we're working now very, very closely with school districts throughout the valley to help them transition into the real-time air advisory network program. That includes things like providing them with free um, TVs, and monitors, we're calling them reads, they're real-time electronic air quality displays. They can actually place these in lobbies, other areas of the school where um, parents, teachers, um, students can actually see this real-time air quality level. We're helping them put policies in place that help them at the school district level, you know, with the flexibility that they need um, to, uh, to put together sort of their response, you know, whenever they, they, they see air quality issues. and and need help and kind of understanding, you know, how to read those and, and deal with issues as they come up. It's a very, very active program right now. We're actually piloting um, those reads as we speak. We're looking for, for schools that are willing to, to put them in, test them, let us know how they work, you know, enhance that process. It's something that's actually a big priority for us right now, and, and we have, you know, some staff that are working diligently to try to get schools um, that the assistance that they're looking for in that program. So again, if you have any any districts in, you know, in mind or specific schools or other, other things, other ideas that we can um, take advantage of to make that a success, I'd really appreciate that. So you know, coming back to um, uh, kind of the air quality challenges that, that we have, you know, one of the big pushes that we're, we're, we're making right now is really looking at ways to push transformative technologies in, in, in the valley. Um, you know, we, Clearly, uh, as we put together our attainment plans and our strategies for PM 2.5 in, in particular, um, have a need for, you know, for a lot more emission reductions in, in, in the valley. Even with the 80% plus that we've reduced from stationary sources over the years, with all the mobile source reductions that are coming from the measures that are being put into place, there's going to be a big need for continuing to look for creative ways to keep reducing emissions from, from a variety of, of sectors. And so we're looking for significant additional reductions from mobile sources, you know, and I know obviously that um, this room, um, you know, deals directly, you know, with, you know, with those issues and, and as you think about interesting projects, creative projects that you think would, would, you know, be a fit there that provide those air quality benefits that are very 
um, desperately needed for us to meet these federal standards. You know, I encourage you to really have that conversation with us and see if there's ways to partner together to, to make those projects happen. One of the good news um, stories related to this is that due to a lot of advocacy work um, by a lot, a lot of folks you know, right here in this, in this room and throughout the Valley, we were able to actually secure um, quite a bit of funding this last legislative session directed to the Valley for a variety of projects that really fit into what I'm talking about right now. Um, you know, and I'm talking about specifically the cap and trade um, extension and cap and trade dollars that, that have come through. Um, you know, without taking any positions on, you know, whether you agree with um, the cap and trade program and, you know, sort of the under, underlying pinnings or, or logic behind that, you know, our big goal has always been to make sure that whatever is put into place, you know, we see that money coming back into the valley, as much of it as possible, given our, our need for air quality disadvantaged communities that we have here and just making the case that we need that funding to come back here to help us with our with our challenges here and we were able to make that case you know very very effectively this last year to where we're now seeing hundreds of millions of dollars of that funding being allocated right back back into the valley and it's for a variety of projects you know everything from um, zero emission and low emission school buses and transit buses to heavy duty equipment trucks you know going up and down the valley light duty vehicles. A lot of you have probably heard or maybe even have helped us get the word out about our tune-in tune-up program and some of the, the new replacement programs that are kind of related to the tune-in tune-up programs. There's a lot of opportunities within this funding that we're now very actively working on trying to develop and, and make sure that we, we provide access to that funding to everybody here in the Valley who's, who's willing to partner and, and take advantage of, of those funds. And, and as we move forward here in the next legislative cycle, it's going to be an ongoing battle. Um, you know, one of the big things that we saw this last round was the bigger areas in the state population-wise were not very pleased with the fact that, you know, the Valley was able to win out so big on a relative basis, just population-wise. And so there's a lot of activity going on in terms of, you know, trying to, to kind of redirect funds and, and make sure that we're not really getting out um, with as much uh, funding this year as, as we did last year. And so. That work continues in, ma in making sure that we keep fighting and making the case for the Valley's needs and, and advocating for that funding. And so that's an invitation as well, really to work with us to, to really understand those dynamics and, 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 and get that message to Sacramento that you know, to the extent that there is funding available, that it should continue to be directed here for the types of projects that we think are important and would be beneficial to help us with all of our, all of our challenges. So you know, I'm not gonna go through all of the funding streams. I just wanted to give you kind of a highlight of that. I'd be happy to to really walk you through some more details about you know where you know where we see some of that that funding going. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, to bring up to you because I think you're gonna you're gonna start hearing um, some more about about this program as we move forward with it. Um, and, and some of you you may already be involved to some extent in this is AB 617. This is part of uh, uh, the legislative package that was adopted last year, and it's really. Um, it's in its, its infancy right now in terms of you know development and implementation, but it's really taken off pretty fast here um, this year, and it's going to really um, be a huge program over the next couple of years. And it's and it's you know it's one of those programs that as we work um, to understand the mandates with ARB, you know we're trying to have a very heavy public engagement process to make sure our Valley residents and businesses and agencies are aware of exactly what's gonna happen under this program. And so we've been having some public workshops and meetings. We have a web page right now where we're trying to really have a clearinghouse of, of information you know, as, as this program's developed. And it's got a number of components to it. It's really a kind of a community-focused program. It's gonna basically take the state through a process of identifying you know, what are considered the most impacted communities throughout the state and then doing a combination of air monitoring, um, uh, emission reduction plans in those communities and sort of ongoing follow-up and, and, and reporting to, you know, to hopefully you know, bring um, some air quality improvements into communities that might otherwise, you know, under, under this framework, you know, maybe haven't been getting as much attention in the past with the existing air quality programs. And it's, it's something that, you know, um, again, you know, from a regional point of view, you know, <laughs> as compared to other parts of the state, you know, we continue to make the case that, look, we have a lot of disadvantaged communities in the Valley. So to the extent that there's funding related to this program, keep, you know, directing it to the Valley so we can put that money to good use and, and hopefully achieve, you know, some of the, the, the benefits that we're all, we're all looking for. So that's a program that, again, is, is gonna be taking up a lot of, a lot of oxygen, really, um, as it keeps, you know, being developed by the state and as mandates are, are better understood and, and deployed. 
I think the last thing I, I wanted to, to bring up today, and it's all really related to everything I just talked about, is, is the big effort that we're making right now to seek partners with respect to all of this funding that we've been able to, to see allocated in this, in this last um, round with, you know, with the cap and trade money, with some of the other funding streams that we have. We're really making a big push right now to look for partners on, the, on that funding. Um, we've had a number of meetings um, where we've sort of teed this up a bit, and I'm, and I'm really, you know, I want to close on this point because I really want this to, to be the, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the hello, supervisor. <laughs> it's my boss. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to, to really, you know, have this be sort of a takeaway, you know, from, you know, from this meeting in that we do need to find, you know, really effective ways to get the word out about this funding and develop good projects, good partnerships with, you know, with everybody throughout this valley to, to, to put, you know, this money to good use. So there's, there's a range of potential projects, you know, where, where we see this funding playing a role. You know, again, everything from heavy-duty trucks, heavy-duty diesel tractors and other ag equipment to medium-duty, you know, more regional applications as far as, you know, delivery vehicles and things like that. You know, irrigation pumps, um, ultra, you know, all-terrain vehicles that are used out in, out in the fields, alternative fuel infrastructure. You know, this is one area where, you know, we have developed some really good projects, you know, in this area being, a, a, you know, a hub for some of those types of projects. You know, and to the extent we can find, you know, even more ways to develop that infrastructure and put it into place, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for that. Locomotive projects, you know, this is something that comes up pretty often. Um, you know, not only here, but throughout the valley. So these are, these are big opportunities for us with this new funding that we have in place right now. Yard trucks, forklifts, school buses, transit buses, you know, these are all areas that I'm sure if we put our heads together and, and work with our partner agencies um, here in Kern County, we'll be able to find some really good projects. So as far as moving forward, you know, we're going we're gonna to really be kicking off some, some very, very intense public engagement, particularly on this issue, on, on having, you know, public resources and tools available getting input from the public on, on how best we could put those monies to use, getting ideas for projects, you know, making sure that we understand what the needs are in the communities, and just really leaving no stone unturned and looking for additional ways to reduce pollution, you know, particularly by utilizing these resources in, in the right way. And then working together you know, with, with key policymakers and our, and our partner agencies on advocating for those resources coming back to the Valley. It's going to be another round of that this year. It's already starting. Uh, it's been in place for this year. It's going to be an ongoing battle. You know, I think there's going to be a lot of competition by, you know, by other parts of the state to really fight for that money. And so keep your eyes open for that. And, and if you think of any ways that you can help us and we can help each other on that, on that messaging, I think it's going to be a big priority for us in the coming year. And so I wanted to keep this you know, relatively um, short as far as my, my presentation to hopefully allow some time to take some questions and maybe have some conversation about some of those key areas that we're working on. So. Turn it back over. Okay, thank you. We have a question, Mayor Wood. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask you about these reed systems. Although nature creates more of our own air quality on the East Kern side, how do you get involved in that program? What does it cost? Who do we need to contact? Because that's still something at the high school level for sure would be a great interest, or maybe even at the middle school level. How do we get involved yeah, in that, East that, Kern? That's a great question. Um, well, well, just so, to make so it Mayor, easier, you can call. Uh, I'm sorry. So, Mayor, let, let me interjects so the the san joaquin valley air district it only covers the san joaquin valley portion okay. of our air yes. district then so never mind I'm, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> what i was uh, what one thing i could do is we could we could talk to our counterpart over there and see if they you know if they could use any um help in developing a similar so you know i i, I guess certainly you know thank you yes and to, to answer the question because it was a good question for the rest of the valley um <laughs> uh to make it easier, you've got my name. Just call me right now. Now, um, the, we, were, we have a, uh, the outreach department who's really been leading the charge on that program. The other component to your question was cost. We're, de we're providing these for free to schools, so there is no cost. Um, what goes along with that program is we work with school districts to really develop a tailored policy for, you know, at, at that school level, because we do understand that different school districts have different approaches to how they deal with communicating with coaches, with teachers, there's, you know, there's a lot that goes into developing an air quality sort of education program within a school district. So it's not just the notification component, but we work with schools to really try to give them the whole package of how do we, how do we develop something that actually works for you and what do we need to give you to help you with that? And, and that's all free. I mean, you know, just, it's just the time that it takes for the district to really, 
you know, provide some resources on their end of, of people who can work with us to, you know, to get that in place. That's really the only commitment that we have to get, you know, from, from a school district, so. Thank you. I'll give you my phone number. <laughs> so it's, uh, I can be reached directly at 559-230-6036. Mr. Smith has a question for you. Uh, first, congratulations on your uh, Thank you. new job. Uh, always appreciate working with the Air District and personally with you. Uh, I appreciate that you started off with, and you have been consistently talking about the progress we made. I think that's something that needs to continually get out into the community. Uh, people don't realize all the progress that we've made and, and really how far we've come and, and with visualization is still where we were 20 years ago versus where we're at today. Uh, in today's paper, the, the annual Lung Association article on how we're the worst in the nation and, you know, worst is much better than what worst used to be is, you know, is the point that needs to be made. Uh, you talked about grants and stuff. We're, been thinking about and working on for some time uh, parking rides along the new freeways and stuff is that something that air district participates with yeah and I it, let me answer that question and I want to make one quick comment on the American lung report so on the park uh, parking rides are an open and eligible um, grant program for us right now so if there are if there is interest in Kern County for parking rides talk to us so we can we can work on that and there's really two there's two potential programs for that depending on the size of the park and ride. So for a relatively small to medium sized one, there's there's a there's an open, very quick kind of first come, first served. There is currently funding in that in that program right now. We can almost immediately um, provide that funding and it and it's worked very well. Um, now there are there have been some larger scale park and ride projects, much, much bigger cost type projects where we have another program for that and that one just takes a little bit more. It's something that we would take to our board as opposed to you know just immediately being able to enter into a contract, mm -hmm. but that, that that is available as well. So it really just depends Great. on the scale of the project, and each one has a path in terms of how we'd be able to partner with with you on that. On the American Lung Report, I'm glad you brought brought that up and you made that observation. If you look carefully at the um, at the fine print in that report, what you'll see is that progress. You know, and you kind of have to read it and just you know look for the footnotes and everything, right. and it's it's actually in there. But of course, because of the methodology that they use and kind of the 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 angle that I think is taken by that report. You know, it's an F, but it's a much, much better F than it's ever been right. kind of a thing. So, it, you know, uh, Great non take a look always. at it carefully. And then, you know, and like I said, it is good to focus in on that progress and then talk about how do we meet, you know, where we are today and keep, keep looking for ways to improve it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And just one last question. Uh, city of Bakersfield, ninth largest city in the state now, and, and we sometimes have a seat on the board and that rotates. Uh, when would that come up again, or any idea? <laughs> well, I tell you, if I could, <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's uh, um, it, it is a very um, complicated process. You know, there, the the special city selection uh, committee, you know, has basically established a uh, you know a rotation and a process for that to occur. And under state law, there's there's actually, and I'm, I'm sure you're you're at least somewhat familiar with this. Um, there are there are different requirements that have to be met you know, in terms of you know how many uh, large cities um, uh, sort of you know where you can have small cities and large cities and not being able to have them in the same area at the same time and and so you know um, it really just depends on you know when vacancies come up and then what that rotation schedule would you know would would establish there there isn't a a hard and fast date for that you know right now all of our our board uh, positions are filled. Um, you know, so we under the current dynamic, you know, so if we were to have vacancies, depending on where they occur, there would be a rotation, and conceivably, you know, that could push it to small city and in, in, in Kern, but it just depends really on, on when and where those occur and what the process basically outlines for it. That's not a very clear answer, I, I, mm -hmm. I realize, but it, I really don't ha actually have a, a date right. for, for you to provide, so okay. it's, it's, it's a pretty complex process. Chair, I have a couple questions. Thanks again. Yeah, Ms. Barra? I have a couple of comments. One regarding your marketing. I'm with Council Member Smith. It needs to be shouted from the rooftops and so that people know. I mean, riding a bike for 30 years to and from work, I have, I've seen the difference. I've seen the difference, you know, I've seen the mountains in the morning or, 
you know, going out to the bluffs and being able to see beyond the oil fields out there. And it just seems like the the bad air people get all the press, you know. We never get the, the that it is, like you said, it's the fine print all the time. So that needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Um, also, to, also, the marketing that you're doing with the app, uh, Golden Empire Transit has a has some uh, grant money to do rides on the bad air da days, free rides. on. So if somehow the marketing can tie in together so that they can either be notified through the app or through Get or something that, that tells people that this is a bad air day and this is a day that you you can get a free ride on Golden Empire Transit that day. Uh, so I don't know if we can work with our marketing people and with your marketing people to try and figure out, you know, how we can do that. Uh, the other thing I had is where are are you at on bike vouchers? I know you give vouchers for electric. There's for uh, electric cars, for lawnmowers, that kind of stuff. Where are we at, at on bike vouchers? Uh, so as a you know, like if somebody was trying to get out of a. Uh, like through a vehicle program or something like that yeah. as an alternative to, to yeah so that that's something that we've continued to to um, to explore um, and the reason I asked that was because there's a number of other programs that we are actively that, that kind of do the same thing in terms of bike sharing and mobility there's some new grants that we've been able to put together that are deploying you know some of the, some of those types of programs um, but one of the things that we're hoping to be able to do with our new and much expanded program that we're doing and this is part particularly targeted at, at lower income communities, but it's, op it's actually it's open to any, any Valley resident, but there's a little bit more money in there if, if you happen to be low income. Um, through, our, through our tune in tune up and the new sort of vehicle replacement program, there's a couple of things that we're exploring there. There are things that have come up as suggestions, including you know, e-bikes, and, and right now you get transit passes, for example, as an alternative to having a, you know, to come into a cleaner new vehicle. Um, you know, so we are looking at those things right now. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see if we're able to put as many of those, there are guidelines that we have to follow under that funding. It's state funding, and so there's some prescriptive stuff that, you know, in terms of what we're able to provide. So I think if we can find a way to kind of work those into that program, that might be, that might be something that we could do. Um, you know, I think with respect to the other question that you had on the, on the buses and the, the free ride days, um, yes, we'll follow up, I think, on the outreach. I think that's definitely something we want to have the conversation about. I think secondly, um, to the extent that there's funding that would help with offering those free rides, we've actually got a program in place that where we partner with transit agencies to really help buy the cost down of those tickets. And so I know that wasn't quite the question on that one, but I think there may be an opportunity there as well. If that's something that, you know, maybe there's some difficulty in helping on that side of the equation, we could actually develop an agreement where we might be able to help with some of the costs associated with those transit passes. So that's something I wanted to offer as well. Grace, you have a question? Okay, good question. That's, that's a great question. I should have mentioned that. It's it's called Valley Air. So if you go to either the uh, iPhone store or Google Play and just search for Valley Space Air, and I think you can probably find it a couple of other ways, but that, I think that's probably the easiest way. That should the first one that comes up should should be our app. So. Um, let me know if you have any issues with that, but I went ahead and downloaded it myself immediately, and it worked for me at least. So, um, yeah, let me know if you have any problems with that. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all very much, and just keep me in mind if you have any questions about air quality stuff or funding opportunities. I'm happy to, to respond immediately. So thank sure. you again for your time. Sure. Sure. Could I just thank you guys for coming down? I know it's a couple-hour drive for you, and I just appreciate you being here for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You ready to go into the next meeting? <laughs> you guys want a one minute break or are you ready to go to the next meeting? Rock it, girl. I'm cool with it. <laughs> Let's call the current Council of Governments Transportation Planning Policy Committee meeting to order. Please stand for the flag salute. Salute pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and 
to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Ortiz? Here. B. Smith? I am here. Wood? Here. Vallejo? Here. Mock? Cantu? Mauer? Here. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Here. P. Smith? Wegman? Here. Couch? Here. Scribner? Here. Navarro? Here. Para? Here. Kersey? Thank you very much. Public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for the conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Good evening. Uh, Lieutenant Ian Silva with the Kern County Sheriff's Office. I just wanted to give my uh, our regular update of our contract that we're working on. Um, we are beginning the fourth quarter of our 17-18 fiscal year contract, uh, which is our fourth cycle of a contract with Kern Cog. Since July, since the contract began in July, we've been at 110 work sites, which we calculate to be roughly 100. Uh, I'm sorry, 877 hours of detention deputy hours. Added on to that, added, when you add in the inmate labor, it comes out to about 5,262 hours of labor, cleaning up uh, areas. Some of the areas we've targeted in this third quarter are uh, we've been to Delano, Shafter, McFarland, Lamont, Wasco, and Bakersfield. Um, quite a bit of work in Delano. There's been some, some areas there that we've been needing to clean up. I do want to point out we did recently have an interruption in services. Our contract with Kern Cog is supported by our uh, separate contract we have with Caltrans. They provide the bump trucks that pr provide protection for our uh, inmate crews. There was a delay in getting our contract with Caltrans um, uh, renewed, but that contract has been renewed, so we should be back up to full steam coming here. Uh, our contract in, with Caltrans should be uh, up and running again in, on May 1st. So we'll be back to full business and carrying on. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to address them. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Moving right along. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before action is taken. We have items A through M. Roll call vote. Ortiz? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Mauer? Yes. Kraut? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Navarro? Yes. Para? Yes. Kersey? Yes. Thank you. Item number five, update on target setting for SB 375, greenhouse gas emission reductions from passenger vehicles for the Kern Cog 2022 R tip, Mr. Ball. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Uh, this item, you may remember, uh, Senate Bill 375 is the state's effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicle be, uh, passenger vehicles, uh, primarily through uh, better coordination of land use planning with our transportation plan. And we spend a lot of effort in our regional transportation plan demonstrating that we're going to be able to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the state in this process under SB 375 sets targets. 
and we've got to attain or show, demonstrate with our modeling that we're going to achieve those targets. And uh, the state is required to update those every eight years. They just did in March. They'll be effective next October. And uh, that is after the completion of this current regional transportation plan that you'll be considering uh, this August. And so the, um, uh, uh, the item before you here is an information item letting you know that the state has set a new target at a 15% per capita reduction by 2035, but it will not be effective until the 2022 RTP, the Regional Transportation Plan process. Uh, also, just kind of wanted to uh, connect this, the greenhouse gas emissions, and this, this is an, an important issue. The things that we do in our regional transportation plan to, re uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is also helping with our criteria pollutants that uh, Samir was just uh, explaining. And some of these uh, new particulate matter and ozone requirements that we have are going to be harder to attain uh, if we don't do everything we can on both uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction as well as uh, our health-based criteria pollutants that we're also trying to reduce. And so that really concludes my uh, presentation at this point. I'd be happy to answer any questions related to the staff report. And again, this is an information item. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Ball? Seeing none. Caltrans report. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Famoso State Route 4699 Bridge, bridge replacement at the State Route 4699 separation. The project is continuing to perform earthwork in preparation for the bridge construction. Utility work is being performed on the south side of the project this month, and you may experience some closures related to that work. Uh, State Route 99 Taft Highway Rehab Project. Pavement rehabilitation on State Route 99 near the city of Bakersfield from north of Herring Road overcrossing to Pacheco Road undercrossing. Uh, that project was scheduled to start this week. Uh, State Route 46 conventional highway, segment 4A. This project will widen State Route 46 from a two-lane to a four-lane conventional highway between Lost Hills Road and I-5. Uh, construction commenced on April 2nd this month. The contractor is constructing abutments for the new bridge. This work will continue for the next two weeks. Then the, contra the contractor will replace K-Rail at, at Kern 46 and Kern I-5 within the next three weeks. The Cotton Cottonwood East Rehab Project. This is a pavement rehabilitation project on State Route 58 in Bakersfield from the Cottonwood Road undercrossing to just east of the State Route 58-184 separation. That project started on April 2nd as well. The contractor is going through the required submittals and have started the first stages of work. This project is expected to be complete by March 29th of next year. Current State Route 65 Rumble Strip Project. Install rumble strips on State Route 65 in Kern County from 7th Standard Road to north of Avenue 196. Construction is in progress and expected to be complete in late May. And the final project, Kern 33 and State Route 119 Rumble Strips. Construct center line rumble strips in Kern County on State Route 33 and 119 at various locations. This project is approximately 75% complete. Uh, the project will need to delay for approximately three weeks to accommodate another project within the same limits. Uh, project completion is now anticipated to be by the end of May. Um, it was brought to my attention last month. There was a question about a uh, segment of State Route 43 uh, near Pond Intersection. So we did bring that to our traffic investigation team's attention. Um, they first looked at the intersection itself. And what we're going to do as an interim fix is we're going to put out um, solar flashing beacons in that area. We'll probably have those up in the next probably six weeks or so. Um, as I mentioned, those will be temporary while we order the permanent uh, temporary flashing beacons will be placed on the north and south approaches of the intersection. Um, to initiate that project and get it up and running, we're probably looking at probably like eight months or so. But like I said, in the meantime, we'll have the flashing beacons um, out there immediately. We also looked at the segments north and south of the intersection as well for um, crossover collisions of center line. Um, from the traffic data history we have, there wasn't a pattern established. Um, for crossover collisions from the, from the rumble strip projects to, to warrant a rumble strip project. So what we'll do is, while we don't have immediate payment job in the area, the plan is that once we initiate a payment uh, improvement project in that area, 
but will include rumble streaks because the concerns have been raised of crossover collisions. And with that, if there's any questions, I may be happy to answer them. I do. Sure. We've had some recent deaths on Highway 43 between Wasco and Shafter. Mm-hmm. Um, five people were killed. Is there any way that we can put center dividers from Wasco to Shafter in that area, some kind of barriers in the middle? Uh, cars, there's a strawberry little uh, stand. People will cross over. They'll just flip a U right there in the middle mm-hmm. of the highway to go the other way to go to the, or if there's a legal vendor on a corner, same thing. They stop, they cross over, um, they park out in the middle of the road. It's it's just getting really, really dangerous on Highway 43. Okay. All the way from Shafter, all the way north past Delano. There was two more, three more people killed on the Tulare side of 43 last week. It's, it's really, really dangerous out there. People don't stop at stop signs. Uh, the pond uh, intersection is very dangerous. They think they can beat the traffic all right, the time. Right. And then you've got the railroad tracks right there. Right on the west so side. So when an 18 wheeler is trying to do that, I mean, I, I see wrecks probably once a week on 43. And a lot of them never get reported because if it's not a, a, a death, or a really bad accident, nobody reports them anymore. So I, I think there's a lot more accidents on 43 than uh, we realize. Right, I'll be the first to admit, usually the traffic data we're working on is not as current as what you're realizing that you're seeing in the past mm-hmm. several weeks or months. Typically ours are a couple years old. So they usually look at like a three year rolling average and trying to establish the pattern. They'll also consider things like in this situation where there hasn't been a lot of ongoing development. They kind of assume that pattern is good, but I will be sure to bring that up to their attention about the more recent activities you're referring to. As far as a divide, um, there's no center meeting out there. So you're referring to something like channeli- channelization out there, like well, channelizers? or From Wasco to Shafter, there is a dirt. A little uh, dirt medium? Yeah, there is. It's not boom, boom. But um, I, I really wish you guys would look at that Caltrans because mm-hmm. it, it is dangerous. And I, I just don't understand these deaths i mean it's every week that we're 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 seeing these deaths on 43 it's like remember when 46 they used to call it blood alley Blood Alley. i mean and we fixed most of 46 but um it the families would really get some solace out of this if they thought we were actually trying to put signs up or trying to put something center dividers along that section sure I'm just asking. No, I understand. And obviously, I understand safety is, one of our, is our biggest importance. So what I'll do is, um, like I said, this was brought to my attention recently. I know um, our traffic investigation looked at over the past month, but maybe I'll follow up, sit down with our deputy and, and see what other alternatives we can look into and explore. Uh, I, I would surely appreciate it. Understood. Appreciate that. Thank you so that. much. No, thank you. I have a cu- question. You got a question? Uh, yeah. A while back, we were told that the Highway 14 project would have a ribbon cutting end of April, first part of May. Um do we so, have a timeline? Yeah, I'll give you a... My name is Brian Winsenried. I'm here representing projects in Eastern Kern. I'll, I'll give you an update on those. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, touching on those projects, that project is currently... Um, their paving schedule for to start April 19th, weather dependent. Um, we expect, we anticipate the completion to be in June. Um, as soon as we have a scheduled date for a ribbon cutting, we will definitely inform you of that we don't have a definite date at this point but yes with the weather and yeah sorry so so it's been put off but weather dependent we're expecting to complete that project in june so we will keep you informed of a ribbon cutting and make sure you're aware thank you all right um other projects in eastern kernet are coming forward is we have a summit overhead bridge rail it's to upgrade bridge rails at tehachapi at the uh, turnoff there at the summit um, that's going to uh, request for funds at the May meeting, and we expect this summer to start kicking off on that, and as lo- well as the Cash Creek Bridge replacement project um, on 58, and that's also going to the May meeting, and we'll kick off construction um, later in the summer. Um, in regards to uh, State Route 14, uh, we have a Rosemont Mojave rehab project that we're working on the environmental on that, and that's expected to start in fall of 2020. Um, and we have 
quite a bit of projects that are coming forward um, starting in July now that the STIP and the SHOP have been adopted, such as free, the second phase of um, Freeman Gulch and um, some other projects in the Tehachapi area and uh, Mojave area. Any questions? Madam Chair, may I uh, add something? And, and uh, the, the council member from Ridgecrest may want to weigh in on this, but uh, I know it's not your district, but there were some recent accidents in San Bernardino County just south of, uh, of Randsburg. Uh, That just south over? of Red Mountain, a, a, a couple was coming home, and a car went over the WR line and did a head-on and killed them both. Uh, the last I heard, the driver of the truck that crossed over the WR line was in critical condition. I don't know if he passed away or not. But uh, yeah, um, 395 is a dangerous road. Yeah, we're we're avid proponents of uh, continuing to upgrade that section of Highway 2 as it connects into 58 and with the uh, traffic that's we see on that road especially uh coming up 395 so um I, we understand brian we, we don't have regular contact with district 8 but i'm sure you do would you mind sharing those contacts with us um we meet regularly with um a committee that includes um san bernardino council and um the last meeting we had was i'm gonna say several months ago and they're they, um, there was a joint funding partnership to look at um, improving that corridor down and through um, between 58 um, and uh, 15, and then continuing north from there up to the 395 and 14 junction. Um, last communication that we've had is they're, they're still interested. They have other priorities that they're working on. They're upgrading um, the 58 there at Kramer Junction. Um, but our last contact was, was they're still in the partnership with Inyo Mono and Kern County on actively seeking to, to make improvements along that 395 corridor. Well, they did two projects here a couple years ago. They took away the passing lane going over the hill south of Kramer Junction, yeah. and then they spent over a year doing a 17-mile corridor where they made it a no-passing lane, except they have one little passing lane in the middle, but... For 17 miles, it's a double double yellow line for safety. Yeah. And the amount of time and, and money they spent there, they could have made it a four lane road, I think. But they got plenty of land there. They, they plowed it all off and cleared it and didn't do anything with it. So Yeah, I, I do know that was a safety project and that was um, the solution for what they were seeing. I don't have details, specific details on that project. But I unfortunately, could, I could based on our accident we had a couple weeks ago, people pass over double yellow lines. Yes. So it's a safety project, but it doesn't give us very feeling of safety. So. Thank you, though. Brian, may I ask you a question, too? And sure. this is just a general question. Caltrans, either of you might be able to answer it. We also had a death on Norelia Road, which phones through California City and county property. That is a problematic road with blowing dust and sand. And... Supervisor Scrivener has worked very hard also with others to get that sand removed. We've even taken advantage of that sand for some of our public works project. But here's, the, here's the, where the rubber meets the road on these issues. We have it so bad, the visibility, it was almost like a blackout of sand. And it comes up very quickly, and we had a head-on collision, and we lost a father, and uh, the two children were, were injured, but they've been released, and the other driver of the vehicle was injured but has been released. This just happened uh, just last, last week. How does anyone shut a road down very quickly when these situations arise? Because it seems to me our law enforcement should be involved, highway patrol should be involved, and also Caltrans because of the feeder roads that go into this. You have the Garlock Road, you have 14, you have Phillips Road, and Norelia Road. Who do we call when you have an emergent situation like that we're, that we've been quickly made aware of to shut the road down and maybe prevent another head-on collision? Because when it's zero vis and you're all over the road, you could have been sliding. I don't know, I wasn't physically there, but you know, shut the road down that afternoon until 11 o'clock the next day for accident investigation. So it's, it's a treacherous situation. What do we do? Uh, <coughs> law, hmm? law enforcement. To, it, this was, I'm, I'm 
I missed where, is this on okay. a local road? It is Norelia okay. Road, which will bring Got you it. from California City Boulevard all the way to Garlock, uh, right. to that, that particular road there. Um, so where the accident occurred could have been within our jurisdiction or it could have been in the county. I have to be sure on that. But okay. if we we can't shut the other side of the road, the county side of the road down, we can't shut off the people coming from 14 in or Phillips Road. I mean, where is the one-stop shopping, I'm sorry to say, for notification? Um, usually what I see happens is law enforcement will make a call and shut the road down. They notify us immediately, and then we would respond um, to the appropriate location to shut the road down. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a joint effort in a situation like that. Okay. Um, we also have the same thing happen on our highways where um, the CHP may make a call to shut it down, and then um, we're notified and then respond um, to put in appropriate closures, um, make sure they're safe and things like that. Well, I appreciate that. Coming here today, and my... my uh, Carpooler will tell you, he, he battled some fierce winds just getting to California City, and then we battled fierce winds to about 14 miles east, I mean, sorry, west of uh, Tehachapi today. And I don't know if those, uh, those roadways, well, part of the roadway that's the safest was actually shut down, and we were diverted to another more windy section of the roadway to get here. We slowed down, made it here alive, but I can see unexperienced or, or much older than us seniors uh, have some difficulty in those conditions. I, you know, we can't, it's not Nerf world, I understand that, but uh, um, as far as notifications of road conditions, can we do better? As far as, um, I know that we actively monitor like wind conditions and, and work closely with the CHP on 390, or 14, 395. Mm -hmm. so, so recently you've seen closures mm -hmm. um, when we know winds are, um, we even, we have, uh, weather stations out there where we monitor winds and we know about the speed that you know we see things happening so before we get to that threshold we try to shut the road down or, or make the call on judgments like that um, that's why last week I think it was even closed down um, today we drove down through the winds they were strong we saw um, many trucks but it was it hadn't reached that threshold but yes they were i was just sitting in the park our own park and ride and my suv was just wobbling back and forth like it could have tipped it was amazing and the blowing dust and sand then but yeah. there was visibility it was just a lot of wind yeah thank you yeah. very much i appreciate that thank you ma'am thank you Jennifer. executive director's report good evening uh madam chair and uh, board members i have a handful of items for this uh agenda the first item wasn't on my list but i'd like to remind everyone that Michael uh, mentioned that construction started on Route 46 4A. That re represents over a decade uh, of progress on Route 46. The construction will be going on for about two and a half years at 46 and I-5. Many of you, uh, including Supervisor Couch, were directly involved with some of the negotiations several months ago to uh, put the final pieces of funding in place for that. So thank you all, and uh, please be patient with that construction, but it's, uh, it's a good thing that it's getting done. Uh, there'll be an ITS workshop here in this boardroom on May 2nd. Uh, many of your staff members attended the last one. It'll be between 11.30 and 1 p.m. on May 2nd. March 21st and 22nd, was a CTC meeting in Orange County that I attended along with uh, several other pe uh, members. It was the single most successful um, CTC meeting for the county of Kern. We received over $120 million of funding at one meeting. Uh, <coughs> and part of that is due to your work in approving the STIP and the SHOP. And I think Brian mentioned that that meeting, the STIP and the SHOP was approved. Uh, tomorrow there'll be uh, in Arvin a safe streets workshop. There'll, there's a flyer in your folder about that. That'll be from 3 to 6.30 at Haven Drive Middle School. Yesterday I was a speaker at local assistance training for uh, Caltrans employees, environmental employees in Sacramento. Um, I tried to capture what your staff uh, tells me on how they interact with Caltrans and how they process um, projects. And, and hopefully we'll be making some progress um, with uh, some of our challenges when we have to deal with uh, Caltrans in 
specifically environmental and right-of-way areas. On April uh, 25th, which is next week, uh, the CTC will be announcing the Trade Corridor and Congested Corridor Program. W current Council of Governments has submitted two grants for $25 million and $17 million, and I will be letting you know, of course, hopefully, when we get at least one of those grants. Uh, subject to any of your questions, uh, that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Any questions for the Executive Director? Seeing none, we'll go right into the next meeting. The agenda for the current Council of Gover Governments, the uh, role uh, will stay the same. Okay. Item two, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the Council on any matter, not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. Speakers have two minutes, limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. Consent agenda has items A through J. Second. Roll call vote. Ortiz? Yes. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Vallejo? Yes. Maurer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council appointment. Ms. Napier? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and um, members of the board. Uh, the San Joaquin Regional Policy Council is made up of two elected representatives from each of the eight councils of government in, San in the San Joaquin Valley. It was established in 2006 to provide the Valley Cogs a single voice on transportation, housing, and other issues that are under consideration before the state legislature, Congress, and other regional entities. Kern Cog needs to fill the alternate position on this, on this policy council. Thank you. Have you had any interest? Council Member Smith and Council Mem and Mayor Cantu were the only ones that have contacted me. But uh, it's, it's at the pleasure of this board whether we fill that position or not. I'll nominate Bob Smith. I'll second that, that nomination. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There you go, buddy. Kern Motors Aid Authority. Item A, contract between Kern Council of Governments acting as the Kern Motors Aid Authority and IBI Group for system transition and operation and maintenance of the Kern 511 Traveler Information System. Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the board. Um, this is for a contract between Kern Council of Governments acting as the Kern Motorist Aid Authority and IBI Group for system transition and operation and maintenance of the Kern 511 Traveler Information System. Kern Council of Governments um, released a request for proposal on February 1st of 2018 for operation and maintenance services for the 511 system. Three propo proposals were received by the deadline. They were reviewed by Bud Rice, who is a senior analyst, um, GIS and IT specialist at the Local Agency Formation Commission. Michael Heimer is a regional planner and is responsible for IT here at Kern Council of Governments, and me. The reviewers unanimously agreed that the best proposal was from IBI Group and are recommending approval. The initial term of the contract is three years with the option to renew for an additional two years. There is the potential to add a mobile app to the system in the future at a monthly cost of $5,900, which includes licensing, hosting, operations, and maintenance. Staff is recommending approval of the contract. 
and authorize the chairman to sign and authorize the executive director to add the mobile application to the system in the future when he feels it's needed. Thank you. Any questions? Do we have a motion? Make that motion to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Changeable message signs. Ms. Napier. I'd like to thank, thank Brian Van Wyck for reviewing all my uh, contracts this month. <laughs> I kept him pretty busy, I think. Um, during the January 31st TTAC meeting, staff discussed the potential to purchase portable changeable message signs for use by each agency. The TTAC formed an ad hoc committee to bring back a recommendation to the full TTAC. The committee was made up of Bob Neath, Bard Lauer, Jeremy Bowman, Stuart Pattison, and Alex Gonzalez. The committee made the following recommendations concerning the signs. They wanted them to be solar powered, radar capable, have anti-theft features, be trailer mounted, have full matrix, um, have a width of 96 inches, and they wanted an optional uh, lifetime cell service, which would be priced separately and we would either approve it or not. Um, the action that we we're requesting is that KMA, KMAA authorize the use of KMAA funds for the purchase of 14 portable changeable message signs and that funds be programmed in the F fiscal year 1819 OWP. And they're in the proposed one right now. KMAA obtain prices for the portable message signs and develop a memorandum of agreement for approval by KMAA and each agency. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Madam Chair, I have a question. Uh, remind me, this is like one for every municipality that wants one? Yes. <clears throat> it would be one for each, um, each of the cities, two for the county of Kern, and two for the city of Bakersfield. Okay. This might have been very helpful last week. Yeah. Right away. That's so, exactly yes. what they're exactly what, we're what we want. For. Thank you. Yes, we want these. And this is funds that used to fund the call box system. Exactly. So, do we have a motion? I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you. Executive director's report. Good evening again, Madam Chair and board members. Um, April thirtieth in McFarland will be the um, KCAC dinner. If you're interested in attending, uh, you probably have already received an inv invitation. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley Policy Council annual meeting is in Modesto this year. It'll be May 9th, 10th, and 11th. If you're interested in attending, we've reserved uh, four rooms. I will be attending, and uh, Council Member Smith, as the newest member, you're welcome to join us if, if you'd like. <laughs> Kern COG and the Southern California Association of Gov Governments, the COG just to the south of us, and also the largest COG in the United States, uh, we, me we meet regularly, typically over lunch. I know Mayor Wood has attended those meetings in the past, Supervisor Couch, um, and a handful of others of you. We will be meeting again on May 24th, which is a Thursday, in uh, Valencia. Please let me know if you'd like to uh, attend that meeting. Thank you, Supervisor Couch. We typically discuss uh, items that are of interest to both uh, Los Angeles, Northern Los Angeles, and, and Kern County. Um, some of the things on the agenda are Interstate 5, the Tohon Ranch developments, uh, both in Los Angeles County and in Kern County. Um, you can let me know up to uh, a couple of days in advance if you'd like to attend. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, um, Ms. Mr. Ball in his report uh, stated that we will be approving our RTP, SCS, and conformity documents in August this year. Some, some summers we take August off, other summers we take July off. Uh, this summer we know for certain that we will have to meet in August because of the timeline, so please mark your calendars. Uh, it's very important that we have a quorum on August 16th. The public review period for that RTP SCS will begin on May 18th, and that has slipped about a month. Um, this year we will have a public hearing here at Kerncog on June 24th, 
We will also have one on June 6th in Ridgecrest to make it easier for people in Eastern Kern to attend. And we'll also have a third meeting on June 19th in Arvin for people in Southeastern Kern uh, to attend. In your folders this evening are several documents. One is an article on San Diego Association of Governments settling a lawsuit uh, for, I believe, about $1.7 million um, that challenged their previous uh, RTP and SCS. Schedule of cash disbursements for March. A letter from uh, the United States EPA uh, discussing air quality. An update uh, from Caltrans, specifically for Kern County projects, with with a uh, endangered squirrel on the cover. I think, not sure what that is. Oh, okay. That's a squirrel. A uh, flyer, both in English and Spanish, regarding the Safe Streets workshop that I mentioned in Arvin tomorrow at Haven Drive Middle School. Oh, th and this is very important, a spreadsheet of active transportation program project reporting status. This is a document that the CTC is now publishing uh, monthly and that they have discussed at their meetings um, not allowing cities or counties who are late on their reporting to apply for new ATP grants. So if you see the name of your city or jurisdiction on this list, please, please talk to your staff about getting them up to date on their reporting. A uh, flyer on a project delivery workshop uh, on May 17th after the CTC meeting in San Diego. Joe Stramalia will be one of the presenters at that uh, workshop. A page on our outreach efforts timeline covering the next five months and the minutes from the TTAC meeting of April 4th which may not have been in your packets if they were mailed to you but were in the packets posted online. Subject to your, your uh, questions Madam Chair that concludes my report. Any questions? Any comments from the board? We're quick. You got one? Real quick. Just want to remind everybody, May is bike month. <clears throat> Doesn't mean you have to ride your bike, even though that's the funnest way to get around. But you can get on your get on the get bus. You can carpool. Do anything to. Uh, you can. I don't know if if the Kern Cog website has the where you can register your miles that you've that you're biking or. How, There, there's one through Bike Bakersfield's Facebook or our website, and you can win prizes. There's a prize for a trip to New Zealand I just saw today. There are, um, not from us, I don't know where this came, but, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a national, it's a national, uh, <laughs> yeah. So just remember, uh, May's Bike Month, so get on your bike and ride, or get on the get bus. Thank you, Cindy. We're adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.